Welcome to Evolution of Self with me, Britannia, consciousness coach and trainer, advanced Ho'oponopono practitioner, and general consciousness explorer. In this podcast, I'm going to cover everything that you will need to know to make the shift from a life of automated survival into one of conscious self-awareness. Join me for an insightful, fun, and real program with tools and insights that you can take away and apply directly to your own life. So this week, we've got a bit of a change. Um, Instead of me just talking about all sorts of things, I'm actually going to be interviewing to Michael V. Blake. Um, He wrote the book Spirituality, A Brief Introduction, and I'll put a link to that book in the show notes below. Um, I've really, really enjoyed our conversation. In fact, I think it was only meant to be half an hour, but it went on for an hour because it was that exciting and enjoyable. I hope you enjoy listening to our conversation and our very strange little twists and turns. It was meant to be about gratitude and appreciation. And whilst we do talk on that, we talk on many, many other topics as well. Hello, hello. Hey, how's it going? (laughs) Can you see me? I can see you. All right, okay. Cool, lovely to see you. Jeez. Happy 2020 and roll on 2021. Yeah. Yeah. Good Lord. You know, it's been... It's kind of interesting to be part of history, if you know what I mean. Totally. It's easy to judge people we think of as bad for the world or bad for any circumstance. Um, People such as Hitler, for instance. Um, But personally, I kind of think that, yeah, they're there for a reason. Humanity changes when you have a bad leader or somebody that does something really atrocious. It, it does. And the thing is, is that I think we both know at, at a deeper level that everything is perfect. And, you know, and it's only our ego and our mind that just says, no, this is just nuts. This is unacceptable. <laughs> you know, but in the grander scheme of things, everything happens for a reason. And absolutely, you know, I, as although I, I'm personally, politically, I'm centrist. Okay, so I like to observe both sides and just see what's going on. And I'm just believe in what works and what doesn't work. Um, and the thing is, is that with the current situation in America, you still have 70 million people that voted for the incumbent and 74 million for, for Biden. Mm-hmm. And so clearly there are issues that need to be addressed in America, whether or not I agree with them or stand by them. Um, these issues are, are cut to the core and America is divided. And so um, in, in other words, yes, it's perfect the, what, what's happened you know, and uh, it, it's, it changes the direction of where we want to go, you know, as a country, as, uh, you know, as a race. But what it does is it, it allows us to have a reflection on ourselves and like, who are we in reference to what is going on here? You know, and it's just, so yes, I, I'm, I'm trying not to get emotive about the current situation, but I do know that at, at the grander scheme of things, it is as it should be. Exactly. So. And, and it's funny, actually, because I, I think my frustration lies just in politics in general that we sort of I don't know we there are many people who I suppose would make amazing leaders yeah but I find that more often than not the people that get drawn to those kind of positions are not necessarily the people that I would think would be the best leaders oh absolutely I think you and I have spoken previously the difference between management and leadership you know a leader will inspire a nation you know a manager just makes sure your holiday check form is is filled in you know it's just just a massive difference and I do think that leaders are well politicians originally start out with the best intentions they want to make a difference in the world and you know they want to do good but then it's also quite easy to just get caught up get corrupt uh, etc etc so but yeah I think their intentions are pure to begin with But I also think that a lot of people don't really know, I mean, nowadays sort of ego and talk about the ego is quite common. I think people are much more aware of an ego and having an ego. But I still think it's very rare that people are egoless or that they're aware of their own ego. And I sort of find that in a leader, if you're not aware of your ego, if you're not sort of the one in control, so the ego is the one in control, then decisions get made that aren't in the best interest or aren't for the higher good. They're, they're ego decisions. Um, and that frightened, well, it doesn't frighten me, but I'd like, to, I'd like to see a time when that isn't the case. Absolutely. I mean, wars start based out of ego. 
you know it's 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 a way of humanity either moving forward or actually moving backwards you know there's although we're evolving and there's nothing to say that we can't evolve in the wrong direction and self-destruct you know if, if we can all reach a critical mass and we all decide to head in one direction um with either better ego management or the understanding of the self well then that just that just changes everything you know yeah. so it, it just really depends i mean with regards to ego it's it's so difficult because i try to keep my own self in check but ego is so powerful that even if i have my left arm cut off i'm horrified i'm in pain that's actually my ego reacting yeah. you know so ego has a, a purpose though you just you can't see it as a bad thing you just need to know how to use it and i just don't think any leader of any nation knows <laughs> anything about that so yeah yeah, no, I agree with you. Um, I must admit, I suppose uh, <laughs> I wrote a book, although I haven't published it. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Absolutely fantastic. I know. And while I was writing it, it was all about understanding the self, understanding how we work as humans. And it was, for me, it was a real journey, not just because I've written a book, but taking all of the thoughts that I had and all of the beliefs and all of the understandings and organizing it into a way that made sense made me question a lot of things. And a lot of it was about the subconscious and the conscious mind and how all of that works. And the way I see it is that the subconscious mind and the ego to me is part of that subconscious mind. The purpose of it is just to ensure that we survive. And to me, that's what the ego's job is. It's to ensure our survival. Do you mean at but, a biological level? At a biological level. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't necessarily promote um, the evolution of ourselves. Um, it doesn't promote us becoming more conscious, more self-aware. Um, it's, its sole job is to ensure that we physically survive. And that can be very limiting at times, especially since a lot of the fears that we have and a lot of the beliefs we have aren't the truth anyway. Yeah. So I sort of call it being automated. So a lot of the way I see it, a lot of people run from an automated space. Um, we don't even know when we're sort of running our automated cells and the ego to me is part of that. And then there's sort of being more conscious, which is being more aware and that's choosing to act from a, an aware state rather than just an automated state. So that's kind of where I got to in the process of <laughs> writing. The book. You've also so I, I think that's amazing. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I, I just think that's so extraordinary what you said, though, because I agree with you completely on the biological side of things uh, for ego. Um, but I also feel that ego can, we can make it work for ourselves. So for instance, um, absolutely, it's a, it's at a very low vibration. You know, it's nothing to do with who we really are. However, I do believe that the ego can be used as a signpost to get back to source, to get back to who you really are. So for instance, you know, if, if, if I react terribly, you know, and my ego is thrown out the window, I'm going nuts in the office. Um, it's a sign point to what I call SLC, stop, look, correct. And just remember that this is not who I really am. Like, but at the same time, if, if let's say I am joy or I am love or I am peace, I can't know those, those are just concepts unless I have a chance to experience them, uh, which you know, you know all about. And so fear is ego and I need that fear. I need it to signpost me to who I really am. If I was just pure joy all of the time, then, I'd only have half the experience of what we're actually here for. So it's for me, I try not to look down on ego. I just like to see if I can use it as a signpost and just remember, you know, re hyphen member, you know, with, with who I am with source, etc. But, um, but it's obviously very tough. <laughs> yeah. I'm in agreement with you. I sometimes forget but I mean, when I've sort of, I, well, the way I tend to work is I tend to sort of drop into things and explore them. And um, it was quite a while ago that I was actually doing my sort of exploration work on ego. And I agree with you. I kind of, the way I saw ego was as um, an overprotective mother. It's not evil or nasty or whatever. It's just overprotective. It just is there to try and, you know, it's, its whole job is to keep you safe. But sometimes we don't necessarily all want to stay in that safe space. Um, and actually, I agree with you as well, because I think that the whole reason we're here is to is to experience contrast, to really experience the truth of who we are. Um, and I think absolutely, to me that's absolutely. about being creators. But we can't, we can't experience that exactly as you've said, without the contrast. 
You know, we can't experience bliss and joy and love without sort of fear and doubt and all the other things. Absolutely. And the thing is, it's just good, bad, all of that is all relative, you know. So for me, ego is the difference between up and down. I need one. I can't have one without the other. Uh, you know, and so just from that point of view, I try not to judge it because obviously judgment is ego anyway. So I just try not to judge the fact that, you know, maybe my ego is at play here. But then there's other things like, you know, if I know I'm supposed to be working, you know, I'm working from home from Zoom and it's two in the afternoon, I might have a meeting at say 2.15. My ego will say, look, you've got 15 minutes, actually, if, you know, if, if there's nothing happening in the meeting, there's Netflix there, just click on that button there. You know, is, is that ego or is that who I really am? Is it, it's probably not. So it, it's probably something to do with fear, as in I don't want to be in this meeting. I, I, I fear that I'm going to be asked a question I don't know about, et cetera, et cetera, which ultimately leads a chain reaction to me clicking the button for Netflix. And so ego is everywhere. It was the reason I chose Netflix. You know, it's that, that's how big the ego is. It's in everything, you know. It's true, but also, um, I went through quite a stressful time when we moved to the UK. Um, I don't want to necessarily go into it, but I ended up watching more TV than I would normally have watched. And I remember one day I was watching TV and I was feeling cross with myself for watching TV because I didn't think that I should be watching TV. I should be doing something else. Yeah. And just for some reason, I can't remember why, I suddenly decided not to make myself wrong for what I was doing. Totally. And in not making myself wrong, I suddenly felt so much more energized. And within like about half an hour to an hour, I actually didn't want to watch TV anymore. I wanted to go and do something else. And so I sort of wondered if it was, it was that sort of constantly making ourselves wrong that sometimes we want to switch off from. And watching TV or reading a book or doing something helps us to kind of create space between us being critical of ourselves and, and actually just being present. So it's so funny for me, what you've said is, is double edged, but I say that with joy. <laughs> so, if, you know, on, on the one hand, um, you, you're judging yourself incredibly like, oh, why am I doing this or whatever? But on the other side of the sword, it creates space. It, it allows that, you know, that moment uh, where you can actually move on 30 minutes later. And so that's why nothing is bad in the universe. <laughs> it's, everything is just a matter of perception, yeah. you know? And so I, I hear you completely, you know? Um, and what you're reminding me of is, ah, we, we know the great sages of our time, like Eckhart Tolle, for instance, the power of now, you know, like if, if you're in the moment of now, there's no judgment, you know, judgment is, it's so degrading for the spirit and, and such a low level of vibration. And if you don't make yourself wrong and you remove that judgment element or that expectation element and you get into the now, then anything can be bliss. You know, it's, it's, it really is but it's, it's not easy though all the time. <laughs> sometimes it is, but sometimes it's, it's not. It's amazing the energy as well when you're completely present. I mean, you'll get this. I was driving once, uh, my kids were fairly young, and I was driving from Gaborone in Botswana to Port Alfred, which is about between a 12 and 14 hour drive. And I was doing it on my own. <laughs> and I don't know quite how, but I managed to get myself into just a completely present state. And normally my mind's whizzing off on this and that. And, and I try to sort of be as present as I possibly can, but this particular drive, I, I really managed it. And I arrived sort of at the halfway point or wherever it was we were, I think we were spending the night somewhere on the way. And I felt more energized than when I set off. And normally when I get to that kind of stage, I'm, I'm really physically exhausted and because it's, you're concentrating. So you're constantly sort of being aware the whole time. Um, it was, yeah, it was a really amazing experience and something that I'll always remember. So that's amazing. If I can just broaden on that. So um, depending on how this conversation goes, I mean, I, I, I can, you know, I'm very happy to also bring up the heavy metaphysical side of things as well. So a lot of people might debate, but um, the, there's simple experiments that can be done with regards to, let's say you put rice in one glass, rice in another glass, you know, and fill them up to the same level with water. And for 30 days, you just give one glass of rice, lots of love and you just say a prayer and everything. And then with the other glass, you say something negative, I hate you, I hate you. And then you'll notice that after a month that the one that you give love to, 
you know, has flourished, whereas the, the one that you've given dark energy to uh, has, you know, degraded, it's become darker, it's become more brown and heading to black. Um, and it's the same as, so what love is, is in the moment, it's present moment awareness. And so it's, it's energy in motion. And so when you're driving all the way down to Port Alfred and you're in the now, you're actually at a higher level of energy. So you're in such more of a sync state with source that you're bound to have more energy. Whereas if you're coming from the ego and you're just thinking the whole time and your mind doesn't shut up, that actually consumes a lot of kilojoules. And so normally a lengthy drive like that where your mind wanders and this and that is, it's going to be detrimental. You just want to go to bed, but being in the now, you could probably do a double drive, you know? So yeah, because if you're connected completely to source like that, it's, it's just flowing and energizing you the whole time. It's amazing. Yeah. It's absolutely it amazing. amazing. And that's why it's so important just for our physical health. Like if we can just regularly do meditation, if it's even just 10 minutes a day starting out, just getting into that moment of now, the health benefits long-term uh, are just extraordinary. And this has been proven scientifically. Yeah. So it's, it's important. Yeah. Um, I've been playing around with, um, what was it? Um, Jose Silva's mind control oh, meditation. Not, you ever, no, I'm not that? actually aware of him. No. It was, was it really interesting? I was, I suppose I, I get very curious about things and how long ago was it now? It was actually slightly this time last year, thinking back on it. I can't believe that a whole year has gone past anyway. Um, and I was very interested in sort of, I suppose, learning to project my mind, learning to do stuff with my thoughts. And he had a teaching about, I think it was ESP, extrasensory perception. And and I went into it, but actually I haven't done that as much as I've done doing his mind control methods. And what I really, really love is he teaches you to go into the alpha state. And I think he can actually, if you carry on doing his process and whatever, you can go into the theta state as well. But I don't think I've quite managed to do that on a regular basis, but I can bring myself into the alpha state. And that I find really amazing because it's not even being observant. It's almost just like switching your mind off. And for me, I suppose when I'm talking about it and trying to describe it, it's almost like sinking into this sort of beautiful pool of still nothingness. Um, and it, it is, it's, it's really amazing. I think that's, uh, yeah, it's something I've tried for a while, uh, although I've not actually actively what you've done, you know, like a particular program, let's say, to, to try and actively get into alpha, get into theta. Um, I've done my own meditation side of things, but I, I think you're going to be a lot better than me at that. So for instance, the simple Headspace app, you know, that everybody knows about. Uh, I love that because it's in its simplicity. It's for basically any human being. You don't have to be spiritual. You don't have to be anything. And, and why I like uh, Headspace is within the first sort of three meditations, it actually says, Listen, don't worry. It's not about silencing your mind. Let those thoughts come in and just watch them come in and just watch them go and then watch the next thought come in and watch it go. And, and that's also okay. You know, and then after a while, after 10 minutes of just watching, then silence does actually come, you know, and the, the gaps between thought and no thought do increase over time. You know, that that's the way I see it. But um, it is difficult to try and tell that it or that ego to shut up. You know, so it's, <laughs> the more you tell it to shut up, the more it starts talking. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Having an argument in your head. Um, Abraham Hicks as well. I've, I've mentioned this in actually a number of the podcasts I've done recently because it's been something that I've been playing around with. Yeah. Is the silver mind control method. I've been playing with combining that with something that um, Abraham Hicks mentioned, which is listening to ambient sound. Oh, very nice. So it's sort of almost, um, it's like the mind sometimes needs something to do. And if you can focus it on sort of an ambient sound, or even sometimes if you listen really quietly, you can hear almost a ringing in your ears. And if you focus on the ringing in your ears, and it sort of helps you not to be focusing on the thoughts in your head, if that makes sense. Uh, yeah, in a sense, maybe just uh, uh, directing your attention elsewhere, so to speak, or just... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, here's the thing. I need you to send me some of that mind stuff because um, that's absolutely what I need, especially in the time of COVID, American elections and the nuts that we are for 2020. <laughs> um, so I think that you are just a lot better than I am with regards to that kind of practice, you know, the, the mind physical. Yeah, uh, that's... 
you feel uncomfortable because I feel like you're sort of saying that, uh, yeah, I, I have my moments. <laughs> Recently, I've been fairly good at it, but I, I must admit, it's not something I've always found easy. Oh gosh, never easy. Um, I am just, I'll be honest, uh, I can be guilty of allowing my mind to get the better of me. And um, so I'll always have that battle, but you know what? I'm completely fine with that battle. You know, I've accepted it. <laughs> so um, I, I think I'm good with non-judgment. So I'm not too harsh on myself, you know, so I just try and uh, avoid. Yeah, what, what is your meditation? What is your sort of routine? What do you generally sort of do? Yeah, so... Actually, that was, yeah, sorry, go on. just to sort of interrupt. That was one of the reasons why I wanted to speak to you, because I mean, a lot of people replied to the post that I did on Facebook. And but what I really loved about what you said was that you had gone away and you'd sort of, you, you'd spent some time contemplating it. So you didn't just react and just put a post and just sort of, you know, go from the ego, so to speak. You actually went away and you experimented with it and you played with it. And then you sort of came back and you said to me, OK, I've had a, you know, I've. Yeah. So what did you do with that? Yeah. So, so, okay. Sorry, and what, what, sorry? And then what came out of it? What, um, what so it's, it's very interesting. So um, just for your listeners, um, I think you're, you're talking about the word appreciation as opposed to gratitude, gratitude. and yeah. that both have a certain level of frequency or energy or vibration, but they're not actually necessarily the same. And um, so your post, I thought, was extraordinary because you said that potentially uh, appreciation uh, runs at a higher vibration or frequency than gratitude. So that made me think because uh, I've been on several sort of workshops and retreats and, and what have you around the world. And there's very often a moment of stillness where an instructor will say, okay, cool, everybody, you know, sit comfortably, close your eyes. And we're going to talk about gratitude. What are you grateful for in your life? This and that. And don't get me wrong, that's absolutely fantastic. And gratitude is obviously a wonderful thing and it can create such inner peace. Uh, and just to go on to the gratitude side a little bit more, Deepak Chopra, world-renowned you know, um, philosopher, meditator, what have you, he's excellent at linking science to the metaphysical and he's able to bridge that gap. Um, he has meditation and yoga retreats where he focuses on gratitude and what he does is, is he measures he gets all the health indicators and markers because he is previously a, a doctor uh, he was an endocrinologist so he's he's fully up to speed with regards to western conventional medicine and what he does is he would take all the the regular markers of his um his participants let's say 30 of them and uh, anything ranging from blood pressure, diabetes levels, sugars le sugar levels, uh, what have you. And um, what he does is he measures it over 30 days. And the first thing he does is, listen, this, control your breathing, uh, slow it down because the vagus nerve uh, in, in the brain is responsible for uh, so many health benefits, which with through meditation, you can activate the vagus nerve, but particularly with gratitude, okay you bring all those health markers down so he he has empirical evidence to show that health improves just with gratitude alone okay after a 30-day period so I, I found that quite amazing and then i saw your post and i thought gets even better because if gratitude is powerful um so i i see it as this appreciation is is, is like this okay i am grat sorry i i am grateful for such and such, as in a motivation or a struggle that I'm no longer experiencing. So I'm grateful for that. That's great. That's wonderful. But instead of I'm appreciative for, how about I am appreciative or I am appreciation? And so that just completely changes the energy for it for me. So I am appreciation takes me to a complete state of oneness with, with the universe, whereas I am grateful because I passed my exam. I'm grateful for the people in my life. All of those things, which are obviously wonderful, but it, the, you can see that it's, it's at a little bit lower level than appreciation. Appreciation is at such a high, almost God consciousness level where appreciation is the now. It's, it's I am here, I am feeling appreciation. Uh, completely different to, to gratitude. Yeah. I, I completely hear what you're saying, and and I 
think there's something that you're saying without saying it. So I'm going to say it. And you can tell me if, if that is true or not. I mean, I, I don't mind if I'm wrong. Go on. Um, to me, gratitude's about having certain circumstances met. Absolutely. So I passed my exam and I'm grateful for it. Totally. I've seen a beautiful sunset and I'm grateful for it. 100%. And there's appreciation. You don't have to have any anything met for appreciation to happen. Absolutely. You can appreciate somebody who thinks completely different to you and actually is even irritating you. You can appreciate that their point of view, you can appreciate their way of seeing things. Whereas Absolutely. you be grateful for it. <laughs> Exactly. So I, I started off answering your question saying, oh, they're both wonderful words and, you know, similar, etc. But when you break it down, they're actually quite different. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Like, so I, I try and uh, make the comparisons. So because uh, it's not an easy topic, I, I don't think what we're talking about, because uh, some people just say it's semantics, it's at a level of words. But, you know, so for me, if I can try and compare it, let's say motivation versus inspiration. You know, the higher vibration would be inspiration. You know, you're, you're called to something, something that resonates deep with inside you. Whereas motivation is I'm going to get off the couch and I'm going to do a 5K. So while both are great and motivation is great, you know, you want to lose weight, etc. But an inspiration taps much deeper into inside of who you really are. Um, you know, it's, it's so that that's the way I, I compare appreciation with, with gratitude. Yeah. Something else that, sorry, just reminded me um, that when I was exploring it, because I was very similar to you. I mean, I've got a gratitude group, so you know, <laughs> gratitude was very much part of my life. <laughs> and when someone said about appreciation, I was like, huh? <laughs> I'm sick in here. Um, and so uh, that was one of the reasons why I posted it, because it was something that came up and I was like, wow, that's quite interesting. Yeah. And something that I realized as well is that you can focus on anything. Um, it could be a leaf or um, a pebble, or I'm just thinking of things from nature, but it could be a light bulb, or it could be anything. And you can just sit there and really focus on it and, and decide to appreciate it. And all of a sudden you see it differently. And the more you sit there at one with it, in appreciation with it, the more amazing and magical and sort of, I suppose, the more of source you see in it. Absolutely. And for me, the, the key word that you said there is decide you decided to, to, to be appreciative of, of that leaf. And I mean, decision was everything. And uh, absolutely, you, you became so at one with the moment that you see source and you see yourself in the leaf or you see yourself in the cup of tea, you know, swirling around in front of you and that the universe, <laughs> you are the universe and the universe is you, absolutely. Uh, and to me, that's what love is that's the vibration of love and so i put appreciation on the same level as love i i, I equate the two uh, to to be the same I, I must admit i hadn't looked at it like that but now that you say it i can understand, yeah, I, understand how you <laughs> I, I do think they're both at a, a the same level of um intensity uh, with regards to vibration uh, and frequency love and appreciation are one and the same it's it, that it's, high it's the seeing the source isn't it Absolutely. Source is love and uh, recognizing the source and appreciation is the same thing as what love is. Love is seeing source and so is appreciation. They're one and the same, interchangeable to me. But yeah. And just out of curiosity, when you decided to sort of take this away and think about it, what do you do when you kind of... So I actually don't think about it at all. So I see, I see a word and... Um, a word is obviously something that interacts with my brain. So that is obviously cognitive initially. Um, but I, I'm, I'm actually not really interested in words. I'm only interested in feelings. So words can obviously be misconstrued and, you know, misinterpreted, but the feelings are that that's, that's what is your truth. Obviously it's not everyone's truth, but it's your truth. And when, if you have a feeling that is, is negative or dark, then, you know, it probably, it's, it's just not from your higher self or it's not from God or whatever you believe. It's, it's from something in your past or it's your ego. But then if you meditate on a word uh, without even looking at the letters or the construct of it, you'll feel inside that you have a wonderful feeling, like almost like um, an outpouring of joy or love. And that's actually what I did with the word appreciate. That's why I can't separate love with appreciation because it, for me, it was the same feeling. So yeah, get rid of the word and just feel what does appreciation feel like? 
felt like love. So does that make sense? It does. And actually it speaks into something. So when, when I was talking about with this, the mind control meditation technique, um, one of the things that I've found that I struggle with with it is that as soon as I kind of dip into alpha state, sometimes I can do it really easily. Um, depends, I suppose, what sort of um, what's going on in my life at the time. And other times I find that I think it's my ego, my identity sometimes fights it because you actually have to let go of that to be able to dip into it. And what I realized is I can't think my way into that dipping into it. I have to sense my way into dipping into it. Hmm. And okay. I kind of feel that what you're talking about is a bit similar to that. It's, it's not done with the logical brain. You're not doing it with your thoughts. It's more of a sensing into it and experiencing, experiencing it from a, I suppose, in a way that we're not really taught how to experience the world. So, so absolutely. Now, as, as I said to you, I need to work on things like mind power, etc. cetera. Um, but my preference is to just go to bypass it totally. Uh, and for me, alpha is still a state of the mind. So is theta, so is beta. And um, these are all waves that are measured on, on an instrument in a lab. And that's all great. And the power of the mind is almost exponential. Uh, we, we've only tapped into to such a fraction of it. So what it can achieve for us is obviously incredible. Um, but for me, my preference is just to go straight to source. And um, so, and I just do that with what's going on in my chest. Or how is that feeling right now? What, what am I feeling in my solar plexus with regards to such and such? And so I try to get there immediately um, because I find that if I try and slow things down from, you know, the, the head up, um, I just get distracted and pulled away. And, oh, now I'm thinking about trying to calm things down. Now I'm thinking about this and that. And just I just get into a bit of a spiral. So I just go straight to my chest. <laughs> like what's going on there and before I know it two hours have gone by and it felt like 10 minutes you know so that that's how I and when you say you go to your chest what what exactly do you so biologically my chest but basically just my heart so for me the heart although you know uh, metaphorically as well as biologically it's it's the gateway to who you really are and for me, the biggest obstruction uh, that slows you down to getting to who you really are is the mind. And so that's why I'd just rather not deal with the mind <laughs> at all. So I'll just go straight to the feeling. Um, and that is, that is my truth straight away. And I don't, for me, I don't feel you have to be in a particular mental state. You know, some, somebody can say something up on a pulpit or wherever, and you can instantaneously resonate with it. But you didn't even have to think about it. You just knew from the, the immediate core of your being that, wow, I resonate. So I, I, just, I just want to get straight there to begin with, you know, within one second. <laughs> so maybe I'm a bit selfish. <laughs> with a capital S. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Actually, also, what you're saying is um, a while ago, I haven't done this for years now, but I used to do a public speaking course about ah. um, authentic, or, uh, you know, doing it authentically, not just, you know, how to get up and perform. And Brilliant. one of the things I used to do is I used to show clips of people speaking. And ask people what did you know what did they get from watching the clip and that's exactly what you're saying it was you know some people do it beautifully yeah. and immaculately but there's yeah. a there's a disconnect there's something else going on there um, totally I, I agree completely so for instance like um, someone can say okay yeah uh, love I know what love is this or that or whatever but hang on like if I'm say face to face with someone and it could be anyone it could be a total stranger show them love so that they feel it. So the only way you can do that is by not thinking. You have to be completely out of your mind. You can go right up to a stranger or a homeless person or whoever is on the street and just be there with them in a moment of three seconds and no words need to even be said. And all of a sudden there's an electricity. And I'm not talking about, you know, passionate love, attraction, electricity. I'm just talking about electricity of beingness with another being, okay, instantaneously. And so, and you can do that at a level of power, not power over, I mean power with, like empowering, or I can be, or someone can be in front of someone else and show them joy without doing anything with their body or saying anything about joy, but they can, they can demonstrate at a level of feeling and immediately the other person just feels joy. The only way I can sort of 
maybe help explain what I'm saying is, is like how infectious a laugh is. You can have one person laughing at their phone on a bus and then you have 20 people laughing on it later. No words were said. It's just a feeling. Yeah. And that's just where I want to go straight to begin with. Straight there. Yeah. Yeah. So. That is beautiful. And, and I, I get what you're saying about those three seconds with somebody. I think it's um, going past the ego. It's connecting on a much, much deeper level. Absolutely. The ego gets pushed right to the side. And then for, for once, the ego is the observer. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, yes. it's, the ego becomes the witness. <laughs> when, when you're in that state. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that is. That's really cool. Um, I just wanted to mention just for the podcast was when you were talking about the rice, do you remember, was that the same guy who did that, that did the water? So to be honest, um, I don't think it is the same guy, but I know who you're talking about. Um, I can't think of his name. Do you have it hand? I'm not sure. Um, and unfortunately, um, he's considered pseudoscience. You know, he's not accepted by mainstream and it's yeah. been, you know, debunked apparently by, you know, mainstream science, etc. That's fine. But then at the same time, uh, apparently he does have some empirical evidence that mainstream science is just not willing to even look at. Uh, and I think that's a bit disappointing. And I think it, it is extraordinary how with thoughts of love, uh, you know, there's crystalline structures that look, you know, like snowflakes, like the, the most incredible beauty that can form just with thoughts of love, as opposed to say death metal playing, you know, yeah. to, to a beaker of water and, and how those molecules, you know, coagulate and basically the water looks sick, you know? And I think these are amazing things that scientists need to look at much further you know and to, to you know get much more conclusive uh, results on this um, and i believe it completely i believe it's true because uh, we do the same our bodies are 70 percent water and with you know wonderful thoughts of love and joy and peace and strength and freedom and power we're obviously going to be healthier individuals biologically and if we have constant thoughts of anger fear pain hatred we'll get sick our immune system lowers you know we get the flu and so those water experiments make perfect sense to me. Yeah, they do to me as well. And actually, while, while we were talking, one of the things I was thinking about as well, I mean, I, I love animals. So I've always had a lot of animals in my life. And I've done, I've, I used to horse ride. And I know people that use horses in leadership for leadership training now. And how a person is, the animals react to that. Um, and it's that same, you know, sort of vibration, I suppose. And... If an animal Absolutely. can feel it without you saying it or touching them or whatever else, then surely that can affect water in exactly the same way. Absolutely. I mean, uh, a shark knows if you're afraid of it because it can detect your fear through the water, not just your ripples and your panic. Even if you are absolutely still, it can pick up your heartbeat. Yeah, there's a vibration there, but it, it's amazing. Animals know if you're scared of them, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll react to you. And you haven't actually said anything. You've not moved your body, but they just know. Yeah. No. They absolutely know. Yeah. Um, there's somebody I know who, as I said, uses horses in leadership. And what she does is she, I mean, okay, they, they are sort of leading the horses, but <clears throat> they have to think through either a challenge that they've got or a business plan or something like that. And they lead the horses sort of while they're thinking about the plan. And the horse will stop when they're uncertain or when they behave in a certain way, because the horse is so sensitive. It picks yeah. up absolutely every little minute detail. I think that's amazing. Wow, that's absolutely incredible. So did you do that with your own? I haven't actually done it, although I know that it would work because I, I used to do a lot of um, show jumping and things like that. And I know that when you go up towards a jump, if I wasn't absolutely committed, if I, if there was an ounce of I'm not certain or hesitation, then the horse would stop. <laughs> I think that's absolutely amazing. I think that's absolutely incredible. Although I have one jump about the horse, <laughs> where I was more committed than the horse. <laughs> <laughs> I sat on the ground on the other side with the reins in my hand going, hmm, this wasn't quite how I pictured it. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's absolutely brilliant. Wow. Wow. Gee, thanks for that. Because um, personally, I'm not a horseman. <laughs> but I will, if ever I get a bit afraid of walking past one in the farm here in Ireland, uh, then uh, at least I'll look at it in a different way. <laughs> because for me, um, I'm actually, I would say quite afraid of horses. Um, but that's 
actually because I know how sensitive they are. So I know that I have to behave a certain way else the horse is just going to either come towards me, bite my hand if I'm giving an apple or it's just not going to be interested at all. <laughs> and, and it's and they're all different personalities. Um, I had a Welsh pony when I was young and he was just, he was, he, he was wonderful. His name was Concord and he was, he was round and fat. <laughs> And if anyone knows horses, he was a strawberry rain, which isn't really a very cool colour. <laughs> so he was everything that wasn't a concord. <laughs> oh, brilliant. And um, he, used to, he used to give me uphill all the time. He was constantly challenging me, you know, constantly trying to pull out of jumps if I wanted him to go over them, running me into this, ditching me and dumping me all over the place. Jeez. But my brother, who also wasn't very um, confident with horses, one day I was leading him on concord along a road and a massive truck came past and it whipped off a huge branch from a tree right next to us. If I had been on him, he would have bolted. He would have, he would have, he would have just shot off, most likely kicked me off or whatever else. But because my brother wasn't, was scared of horses, he didn't. Wow. He, he, he was absolutely steady. He was unbelievable. Wow. Jeez. So he looked after him. That's unbelievable. So some horses, yeah. And that's why I think he actually ended up working um, at a Riding for Disabled. Um, I don't know, organization or whatever. Um, and I think that was part of his nature. Is he, he knew the ones he could test and he knew the ones he couldn't. <laughs> I think that's amazing because we know dogs can also behave like that. You know, dogs have an instinct to, to protect and to look after us as well. So absolutely, why wouldn't horses? You know, um, yeah. most definitely. Maybe when you see the next one in the field, think of it like uh, that. Absolutely. <laughs> it's so funny because at a very low vibrational level for me, uh, horses are just big cats. <laughs> so um, yeah they they just want to play hard to get for emotions and then when I give them attention they just throw me out the window and then uh, yeah I, they're just massive cats <laughs> and um, you're not very keen on cats either then <laughs> I'm not a massive cat man eh? <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a dog man so I, I love dogs yeah <laughs> So, um, but hey, listen, I'm absolutely open to the idea. <laughs> but, and, I, and I'll be honest, the reason why I don't gel with horses is not because of them. It's because I have issues <laughs> that I need to be looking at in myself. You know. and, and that's why that's, as I was saying, that leadership stuff is so cool because it helps people realize stuff about themselves. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So I, I, I'm not actually the cat. <laughs> the horse is just being a wonderful horse. I'm the one that has all these preconceived ideas about what a horse is, it's dangerous, this and that. Those are all my issues, you know? Those are things yeah. that I need to look at. So, yeah. And, I mean, we're talking about animals and it's quite easy to talk about animals because the relationship with an animal is very different to the relationship with a human. Is it? Yeah. But actually, <laughs> what we think of humans is also the same way. So our sort of preconception of men or women or sort of class or status, how we react to it is also how those people then react to us. So I agree completely with that. Um, and no, no, I'm just thinking that there isn't even a but, because basically I, I, I've got a dog here. And um, while you're saying what you're saying i'm just comparing you know with the humans in my life and the dog as well and there's not that much difference so you know i'll, I'll give love to a family member but it's not going to be that much different to a dog sure i might physically behave different you know i'm not going to get my sister and stroke her neck or anything like that you know but uh, Sorry. Uh, I actually know your sister. <laughs> you know but um <laughs> Just imagine their faces. Yeah, I'm not going to get at ears and scrabble them or anything, but um, the intention and the feeling and the energy is probably the same, you know, it, yeah. or, or at least not that different. So that that's what I'm sort of thinking when you're saying that, you know. So, um, you know, like I'll, I'll give a little uh, bone stick or whatever to the dog, but for my sister, I'll make a fried egg, you know. So look, there's not that much difference. I hope she doesn't take this the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> she, is, she, she is not a dog. <laughs> I'm glad we cleared that. Yeah. <laughs> Do you mind sending her a text? That would be great, just to verify, just to clear things. Although, although she actually loves dogs very much, if I remember correctly. Uh, yeah. And I, I don't think I was necessarily meaning that. Sort of, I was thinking along the lines of, um, if you have an opinion that um, I'm just trying to think, there was someone I knew that didn't like, was quite shy and didn't like big groups. 
and they kind of their assumption was that big groups or people in big groups or in sort of parties and things like that were sort of offish and not very welcoming and then sort of when we were chatting we looked at it we found that they when they approached groups like that became offish and not very welcoming um, and that's kind of what I meant sort of when you uh -huh. you know who okay. you're being in relation to something what your presumption is it gets reflected back at you the the, the person the group whatever it is responds to you in the way that you're being absolutely absolutely wow wow so sorry being loved, then you should most likely end up getting love so yeah. if you are being loved then love is what you should experience do you know what? so you you're absolutely right so um i remember um for so i went to school in south africa and my final year is it so it's matric and we had this um big dinner for there was about 120 of us um you know in my final class um, there were five classes of us and we had this big dinner where the parents would come as well and we'd be sitting at certain tables and i um i just dreaded going to this because i just wasn't interested you know um uh, school was okay but i it's it's they're not the greatest of memories for me and i just always wanted to either be on the rugby field or or swimming or going for a run i just didn't want to be around you know loads of people and um i remember that arriving at the venue how negative i felt and the energy that came back was also just awful it was rubbish um, whereas, you know, I have a core bunch of mates, you know, there's a good sort of 10, 15 of us that we've known each other from the age of seven and I might not see them for five years, but we'll meet at a bar or, a, or wherever it might be after years. And there's this immediate, you know what it's like, the, 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 the exchange of love on both sides is there's just no effort. It's just automatic, you know, and, but it's, it's because of where you're coming from to begin with. You know, when I went to that venue at the end of school, I, I began that venue in fear. That's how I walked into the building and that's what I got back. You know, it just goes back to the old, you know, discussion about the law of attraction. You know, it's, it's exactly that. It's energy, it's frequency, it's vibration. The, the frequency you put out, the, the frequency you get back. So, yeah. Yeah. I think that's where I kind of come to really on my spiritual journey at the moment. That it's all about alignment and frequency vibration. Um, the rest of it is all sort of conjecture and sort of beliefs and opinions and whatever else. But at its most simple form, it's about being in alignment and vibration. Absolutely. So for me, so it's the exact same thing, what I'm going to say with what you're saying, but I might just use different words. So for me, it's about being aligned with the soul, which is who we really are. And But you don't have to say the soul. You can just say an alignment. Alignment as in whether it's body, mind and thought. It's just one thing one entire alignment yeah i think when i say alignment I, I agree with you what i what i suppose what i mean is the alignment with the the source within me which i kind of see as our truth um and with a source without me if that makes sense sort of i mean i know that they all one and the same but sometimes sort of seeing you know seeing them as one and the same is a little tricky when you're in a human body so when i say an alignment i'm meaning yeah the alignment of the the truth the source within me and source all around me so that's interesting. Do you mind if I challenge you a little bit just to sort of find out a little bit more? Um, where does the soul lie in all this for you? I don't know. I think the source within me is part of the soul. I think it is one and the same. So a part of the soul, it's not necessarily the soul. I don't know because I find that so many people have different views of how things are and they use different terminologies. To me, the truth in me is my soul. It is, it's, it's the, I suppose it's the essence that when you pass on, is the thing that's eternal that carries on forever. So, okay. yeah, I think the soul is most likely another word for that. Interesting, because, yeah, so I, just for me personally, I don't separate them, but I thought it was interesting how you said source. I also love the word source. Uh, and then what else you said was, is besides the source inside you, you talked about the source with everything. So so what I, what I do when I describe the soul is that there's no separation between the soul and any, anything else. So it's the exact same thing that you're saying. You know, so for instance, at a, at a, you know, scientific level, at a quantum physics level, there's no, you know, separation between where I end and you exactly. begin, you know, at a subatomic level, you know, there is no separation. Um, and so I like what you said there that, you know, it's about the source in you and being in alignment with the source outside of you. So they're one and the same. And that's how I see the soul as well. It's that essence yeah. or source. Um, the, the main thing for me, though, is if someone said to me, how would you describe the source in you or, or the soul? 
I'll just simply say it's who you really are. Yeah. Boom. That's it. With with a capital W, Y, and A, who you yeah. are. Um, I think when I when I describe it at the moment, and my terminology changes really as I sort of change, but at the moment I call it my truth because it's it Brilliant. is the truth. It's the thing that's everlasting. It's eternal. It's. I agree completely. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's that's not to sort of yeah. I mean, it's just semantics. But. Oh, what you know? It's, some people can say it's semantics, but um, a lot of the time, you know, I also, you know, if I look at words, you know, we were talking about appreciation earlier. Um, I think words are important, and they hold weight, and they hold energy. And yes, uh, uh, ultimately, the the soul or the source doesn't care about a, a construct in a particular human language. Um, so I, I agree completely. On the one hand, it could be semantics, but on the other hand. It, it's a pathway to ser major inner truth, uh, recognition of who you are. And actually, you saying that, I don't think I've ever thought about it consciously, but I suppose I've, I have picked up and dropped words as I've gone along. So I used to use the word universe, but to me that's yeah. limited. Whereas source... Ooh, can I ask why you think it's limited? Um, I suppose because when you look at um, astrology and things like that, they speak about a universe. Yeah. So the word universe to me has limits. Whereas the word source, okay. it's, it's ever, ever generating. Mm, interesting, because so the word universe, I, for me, it's two words. It's uni and it's verse. So literally just singing one verse it's just the oneness of all that is all singing on the same hem hymn sheet oh, you yeah. know so that that's the way i see the universe and but also at a scientific level i don't believe there's just one universe you know yeah. there's billions of galaxies inside this universe and do i believe that there are multiple universes i believe that there are infinite universes <laughs> and do i believe that there was only one big bang no i believe this is the the one big bang that we're in that we that we you know evolved in as humans of a never-ending big bangs that took place for all of eternity so yeah but so i but i can still use universe as the all-encompassing of everything yeah. just one song off the same hymn sheet that's beautiful actually i've yeah. never seen it quite like that that's really lovely um something that i was playing around with and i think i might have only ever shared this with my kids before um i love the the law as above so below um, and I always think that there's truth in things if you can kind of see them sort of expand through different sort of systems and things like that. So I was thinking about the seasons because I think we were coming into autumn. And I always feel a bit flat when we come into autumn. And then it only lasts about a week or two. And then I remember that I really love autumn and winter. And actually, I don't know why I'm feeling flat about it. <laughs> so I was thinking about how, how the sort of the, the world, because I was thinking about my own breathing. And so for us as humans, we breathe in and out many times in a minute, well, a few times in a minute and whatever, many times in a lifetime. But to me, the plants and the seasons, their breath is different. It's sort of almost, or sort of their sleeping rhythms, I suppose. Sort of, you know, they're awakening in spring and they go to sleep in winter and they wake in spring and so on and so forth. And then it started me thinking, expanding that thought into the universe and everything else. And I sort of wondered if we, I was just playing with the idea, I suppose, that as the universe at the moment, it's expanding, isn't it? So it's almost like breathing out. And then at some point, it will Absolutely. breathe back in again, and then it will breathe out. And then breathe. Exactly, exactly. So my scientific friends would be like slamming me at the moment for this conversation. <laughs> but to, to go with what you're saying, so I, I believe that completely and so we're just part of the ex exhalation of the universe at the moment and that's why i said we've had unlimited big yes. bangs so it will contract and come into itself which is the inhalation and then it will explode again and then there will be new life etc but then yeah uh, that that's how i see it so i agree with you completely sorry scientific friends but yeah. um, that's just what i believe <laughs> <laughs> and as i said it was just sorry. something i was mulling over and yeah thinking about absolutely i, I agree completely you know, and um, the, the other thing I love there, sort of a little bit different, but still on the same topic-ish, is the spherical nature of everything at a subatomical, sub subatomic layer, uh, you know, whether it be a plant or a leaf or, you know, the skin at the tip of my finger um, or a rock on Mars uh, under a microscope, uh, you know, electron microscope, they all look the same. 
and so I think that's amazing. There, there is literally no separation between the gas on Neptune and the ulcer on my foot. And so from, from that point of view, uh, that's also, I don't know if that works into your as above, so below uh, as well. I've been very interested in, um, uh, what are they called? Um, do you know Melchizedek? From below Melchizedek, he does um, different no, shapes and things. What are they called? Um, I'll try and remember what the word is, and I'll I'll put a link to the word in the show notes below for anyone who's as frustrated with me not remembering as, as anything. But it's how these these shapes make up everything, and how like the flower of life is um, they call it the seed of life and the flower of life, and how that's the building block of absolutely everything that we've ever experienced. And I don't I know it in my mind. I understand it, but I don't know it in the truth of who I am. And that frustrates me because it's something that I would really, really love to learn, not to learn, just to know more deeply, because it feels like there's something there that I'm not quite getting, uh, which I find frustrating. Um, um, I, if, if I understand you correctly, so I, I've looked a little bit at uh, intelligence, but they call it uh, divine intelligence within the system of all things, as in there's a, an intelligent design in everything, in the flower, in, in, in a bee, in, in all of that, um, as in there's purpose, there, there's intent in all of creation. Um, I'm not sure, is that sort of what the line that you're no, on? No, it's or? not. It's about, um, there's certain shapes um, that basically make up everything in the universe. Um, which okay. I think very interesting. Very interesting. Sort of what you're talking about with the circle. But I haven't explored the circle per se, but I have read quite a bit about these other shapes, which have a special name, which I can't remember at this precise moment in time. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's actually amazing. Do you know that there's no such thing as a circle? So like, I'm thinking, what the hell? And this is a few years ago where I was like, okay. Uh, and it's not even a, you know, a massive metaphysical discussion or anything. There is technically no such thing as a circle. So if for instance, you draw a circle on a piece of paper and you get a magnifying glass, and you go to the line, you just see squares. So I'm like, hang on a sec. <laughs> and so obviously that's just breaking things down a bit more. And there is no such thing as a circle. It, I, mean, I wish I could remember the name of the, one of the names that's coming to my head is platonic solids. I think they're part of these shapes that I'm talking about. Um, but it's- Are they generally cuboidal or are they- are, but the flower of life isn't. It, there are circular shapes within it. But it starts from source wanting to experience itself. So before there was anything, there was nothing. So yeah. it's that sort of, you know, how does nothing experience itself as nothing? So the first shape that supposedly was made was a circle because it was it basically going round and making a, making a circular shape. And that's not to say that what you're saying is incorrect. I, I need to explore that more. <laughs> <laughs> and then the next shape that was made was um, another circle transcribing that circle. So it was almost yeah. experiencing itself as something. Um, and as I said, yeah. this isn't something that I'm an expert in. It's something that I've looked at and read about and know intellectually, but don't know as a truth yet. Um, it's something I would really love to know as a truth, but it, I still need to explore it more to know it that way. I might be able to help you there, but I could be wrong. Let me know what you think of this. So um, I think both you and I are also fans of um, Neil Donna Walsh, Conversations yes. with God. And in his first book, he talks about um, literally what you're saying. So there's the nothingness, but all there was was nothing. And so, uh, you know, the, the, the concept of nothingness it was just all that was there was just joy and peace uh, at a God level. Um, but the joy and peace couldn't know itself as joy and peace unless it could look back on itself and see the joy and peace that it created. And so th there's the, I, I might, let's use an example of an animal, let's say a, a caterpillar uh, with say 12 nodules, you know, which form its body altogether. And so on nodule one, it's that first, as you would say, the first circle. Um, but it can't really see, it can see a little bit of itself and it can look back on itself in relation to the nothingness and see the creation and go, oh, that's nice, but then it grows and then another, another nodule will form. And before you know it, there's five nodules that make up the caterpillar and it can look back at itself in awe of what it's just created. And that's just magnificent. And before you know it, it it's, it's a 20 nodule caterpillar. Um, and so that for me is, is, is the creation, but looking back on itself and like in practical terms, let's say I send an email 
and I put a lot of thought into a particular email. Maybe someone was brokenhearted or they'd lost a loved one or, or whatever. And I knew that my email, my intention for the email was to be healing and, and loving and to hopefully make a difference in that person's life. Uh, and so I put the email together. It might even be, say, a lengthy three paragraphs. I click send. Now, I know that they've received the email, but I actually want to look back on what I sent to them and feel good about what I sent. And I can look back and I go like, wow, and I'll be so excited. Someone might say, oh, you're just so egotistical. But I'm so excited about the fact that I might have helped someone with the words that I used. And so I can look back on that, at the creation that I put together in that email. So I don't know if that helps from a, a practical sense, you know, to try and get it you know, at a cognitive level and also in a physical level on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, there's the creation, there's the intent to begin with, and then there's the looking back on what's been created and admiring what you've created, Neil if that makes sense. A, I think it was Neil Donald Walsh, wrote a kid's book called The Soul and the Sun. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I know about it, yeah. Um, it, it's interesting because it's quite controversial for kids, but um, for adults, it's, it's, it's a lot easier. I don't know. Yeah. What do you think? Um, I got it for my kids, but then my kids oh, were okay. slightly different anyway because they were brought up by me. <laughs> <laughs> Did they get it? When I say get it, there's obviously there's a big punchline um, there. I don't know if they necessarily got it, but I suppose my purpose was not necessarily that they had to get it, but just that it was in their awareness. Mm -hmm. Because at some point mm -hmm. in time, that knowledge or that wisdom will be in them. So, yeah. I'm, I'm happy for them to just have that as an experience and then to, you know, even if they don't get it in this lifetime, it's still something they've experienced. But for me, I, I actually recommend that book to most of my clients because it, oh, right. okay. it's, it's the sort of being able to see, you know, what you, when, when you spoke about sort of just being with somebody and how there's that an immense amount of energy when you're there in love. Um, just to explain very briefly for anyone listening, and we're gonna to have to wrap this up because I think we, we could carry on chatting like this for <laughs> forever, but we do have to bring it to an end fairly soon. Um, sure. it, it's a story about a soul that goes to the sun and whether you see the sun as God or whatever it is, that's entirely up to you. And it says that it's discovered that it is, was it forgiveness? I think it was forgiveness, that it is forgiveness or it is, you know, whatever. And it wants to experience itself as that. And the yeah. son says, oh, that's just amazing. That's really fabulous. Um, but to experience yourself as forgiveness, you're going to have to have somebody to forgive. Um, and exactly. The soul is really bummed out because everybody's light and everybody's perfect. So how on earth is it going to forgive anyone? And then one of the other little souls, because now a cluster of souls is kind of gathered around because they're interested in the discussion. And a little soul steps forward and says, I'll, I'll help you. I'll, I'll, you know, when you go down to earth, I'll give you something to forgive. And the little soul, the first soul sort of says, wow, that's amazing. But, you know, why on earth would you do that? And the second soul who's offered to give the soul something to forgive says, because I love you. And I just think that's mm. just mm. so beautiful. So whenever I see somebody in life or I get upset by something someone's doing, I remind myself <laughs> that they're there so that I can experience myself in a way that I might not have been able to experience myself otherwise. But it's exactly that. And sorry, I know we have to, to wrap up, but um, just, just going on that. Um, so I actually very briefly went over the soul and the sun about a month ago, um, but only um, literally in a couple of minutes. And for me, the punchline is what you just said there in the end. Sorry if anyone hasn't read it. We're just giving it all away. Um, you don't have... <laughs> Um, you know, you don't have to believe in divine contracts or anything like that. But the way I do see it is, is that um, absolutely at a soul level, there's already prior agreements made with everybody that you're going to meet in your life, uh, which might seem like a stranger at first, but then all of a sudden you'll meet a stranger as we were talking about earlier. And it feels like you've known them all your life. And I'm suggesting that you potentially have, okay, but at a different realm, like the decision that you had, you know, along with other souls before you came into this world were decisions that would be made in order to help you evolve in this life. So going back to the soul and the sun, the forgiveness, you know, without having someone to forgive, you'll never know who you really are. And all of this is just about signposts to finding out but not finding out actually but remembering who we really are so yeah. yeah and and it's funny i've had people in my life challenging situations that i've sort of struggled with and and then i've sort of remembered to ask myself okay what have i got to learn from this 
And almost as soon as I understand the learning that I have to get from the situation, the situation just goes away completely. I've had people that have lived right next door to me and had no intention of ever leaving suddenly decide to up and leave within a week once I got whatever it was I was meant to get from the relationship. It's, it's amazing. Exactly. So they were there That's for it. you and you were there for them in, in some other way, which we might not entirely understand, but all of it happened for a reason. Every person that comes into our life is for a reason. So yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Thank you very much. <laughs> no, thank you very much. Thank you so much for listening today and for joining me on this podcast. As usual, you can find all of my contacts and resources on my website, a link to which is in the show notes below. And if you, if this is before Christmas, you're listening to this before, before Christmas, then I'm doing a short course between the end of Christmas and New Year to help people let go of what has been weighing them down this year, um, letting tying off and completing incompletions in their life and setting new intentions for the year to come. If you're interested and you think this sounds like something you want to do, again, the link is in the show notes below and I'd love to see you there. Lots of love from me to you. Bye-bye.